state asylums, state mental health hospitals, mental health institutions for the mentally insane. Over the years, how we've adapted our treatment with medications and therapy has drastically reduced our numbers in these facilities, pointing to less use and a rundown of some of the historic buildings, leading to abandonment and in some cases, complete demolition. Come with us now on Midwest Ghost Town as we explore the Kirkbride Building Plan. Welcome to another episode of Midwest Ghost Town. I'm Dan Klein, your host, history enthusiast, ghost town and abandoned history adventurer, and I'm excited about today's podcast in that it touches close to home for me, growing up in Cherokee, Iowa, home to one of four designated state mental hospital facilities, the Cherokee MHI, as I grew up knowing it, or the Mental Health Institute. And it's an interesting story how this really all came about because I was actually walking the grounds of the Cherokee State Mental Hospital. And really, I was there just to explore two abandoned buildings that I was familiar with, um, Wade and Donahoe. Now, these two buildings are kind of historically known because they have been completely abandoned. Um, Just the upkeep or trying to save these properties might be out of the realm of possibility with asbestos and so forth in the expense of these buildings. But these are historic buildings built roughly around um, 1928, 1931, I believe. And so Wade being the earliest one built, Donahoe following it, it was just an interesting thing to go ahead and explore these two properties. This ultimately led to the episode of where we're at today of studying the Kirkbride building plan or just the Kirkbride buildings in general, which was the massive unit that is what we know as the state hospital today. So when we hear what a Kirkbride is, historically, those are the the bigger buildings. And of course, I allude to it in the video that I last did. Go ahead and check that out. Um, I talk about the two abandoned buildings, but I do show in the video the actual Kirkbride itself. And this is where we are today, because as we look at this, why would we even go into this segment? We know that we cover ghost towns, but another part that we do with Midwest Ghost Town is abandoned places. And that's kind of where we are today, because as we know, with the, the entire state of the mental health institution, as we know it, has changed over the years, especially with the introduction with medicine and so forth. This has caused a lot of the patients to reduce in number from these massive facilities. And of course, the use not being there anymore, um, some of the usage is leading to abandonment in these buildings. So Cherokee, um, the facility itself, the Kirkbride, is not one of those facilities. However, um, as that has changed politically in the state of Iowa, we know that there was four state institutions um, through the state, one being in Clorinda, Iowa, another one in Independence, another in Mount Pleasant, and of course, Cherokee. So there are our four state. Today, two of those still remain as a facility still being in use. The other two have either changed course, have completely shut down, or have, like I said, changed course into something different. So, um, so we know that the history of these facilities are changing. So let's quickly look where we are today. I'm glad that you joined us. We're going to talk about the history of Kirkbrides. We're going to go into that a little bit and the abandonment of these structures, maybe what caused the lead of these. Maybe you even know of one around you um, if you're somewhere else in the United States or around the world. And if you are, Go ahead, drop a comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, and, and we can go anywhere with this. We'd love to have a discussion on history here at this channel. But let's go over all the history of this. So the Kirkbride buildings itself, most were built between 1848 and 1890. Some of those in rare instances did cross over into the new century um, into the early 1900s. They followed a basic floor plan and in general arrangement, which from above, if you looked, almost looked like a bat wing design. And going on to just kind of looking at the overall design, it it was really on purpose. It was 
a building that was layered. So if you looked from above and you could see that there was different wings that would kind of jet out on both sides. Cases that were most severe, ones that they would almost think that were going to be maybe not probable in curing, they would put on the farthest outside of those wings. And then they would kind of lead inward. And if you look down, you would see the main entrance would be right in the middle. And the philosophy was that patients would be working from the outer edges and working their way towards the middle. So the less severe cases would be closer to the exit. And that was the really philosophy because the thought process was as you are cured, you're going to hit that exit and you're out of there. The Kirkbride plan as a whole, the philosophy of it, was the invention or thought process from Thomas Kirkbride, a psychiatrist from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He developed his requirements of an asylum designed based on a philosophy of moral treatment. Now, you can go further back in history. You can say that this was partly due to the reformer Dorothy Dix and her philosophy of the treatment of the mentally insane. And this kind of crossed down over to Thomas Kirkbride, who had made some trips over to Europe, had seen ways of the treatment that was being done over there. And he really came up with this philosophy of how to help and treat the mentally insane. The typical floor plan of his building structure was that it was one that would receive sunlight and fresh air. And what it would do is promote privacy and comfort for the patients. It was meant to really have a curative effect. The grounds surrounding the hospital themselves would be part of the entire process of the treatment. So for example, nature, beauty, sunlight, fresh air. And I can say growing up in Cherokee, walking the mental health grounds was probably some of the most beautiful grounds I've ever walked on. And I would tell this to friends and, and people who I know who would just not believe me. And I say, well, have you ever had an opportunity to walk any of the state grounds in the state? If you have an opportunity to do it, because that was part of the fo overall philosophy of Thomas Kirkbride. And so you get the natural beauties, the trees that were planted usually are, are beautiful trees, flower beds, gardens, acres and acres of land. And so to this day, you can walk those grounds, you can see just how beautiful that they are. The Kirkbride plan asylums tended to be large, imposing institutional buildings. The Oftentimes, the number of wings on a Kirkbride hospital was about eight. And so we'll go into just how big these were with the accommodation of about 250 patients. Asterisk on this, because obviously we're going to come to a time when that is not even close to the amount of patients that they housed. So 250 patients was kind of his philosophy of what he'd like to see. They were massive, massive in scale. And the Cherokee Kirkbride building alone, listen to this, this is really intriguing, 1,810 windows, 1,030 doors, 46 outside doors, 550 rooms, 200 closets, 23 dining rooms, 30 bathrooms, 57 toilet rooms, 30,000 square feet of tile alone, and 12 acres of floor surface. 12 acres of just floor surface alone, and 93,000 yards of plastering. In fact, it was suggested by Kirkbride himself that they had a minimum, a minimum of 100 acres. He believed they should be on the outside of town, kind of in the country, where it's beautiful, open air, beauty, and that was kind of the overall plan of those grounds. It was also suggested by Kirkbride that there were farmlands on the hospital grounds and sometimes that those were maintained by patients as part of their physical exercise and therapy. In Cherokee, I was familiar with this whole process, hearing old stories from my mother who worked at the hospital. And I would hear stories about their old dairy barn that they had there on the 
on the grounds. And so they would produce their own milk and their own dairy. And if you think about the state hospitals at the time were incredibly self-sufficient, their own farms, their own dairy, their own energy supply. They have their own energy plants. And you'd hear stories of tunnels that were underground, steam tunnels and so forth. So they would be very self-sufficient. And in a sense, they were their own community. However, the philosophy changed. Facilities we were talking about that were meant to hold 250 patients crammed with 10 times more of their population as time went on. And and this happened especially after World War I and World War II, notably as war veterans began to be treated for mental illness as they came home. Washington, D.C.'s asylum housed up to 8,000. And Cherokee's facility that I've been talking about at its height in 1945, and note the year here, we're talking about towards the end of the war. Cherokee's height in 1945 had a population of 1,729 patients. The whole philosophy of Kirkbride, he never wanted it to feel like a prison. His whole point of this was to control the numbers, to, to really, he believed that they could, they could heal themselves and, and they could, you know, the, with that proper treatment, leave the facility. Really, as population started to grow, it really started to become one. It really started to become more like a prison. People would hide their embarrassments to their families, people who they deemed alcoholics or those who had conditions today that could be treated with medicine that they couldn't back then. They would just lock them away. You would hear stories of abusive husbands who would lock away their wives because they weren't doing their housework right. You would hear stories of orphans. And so really this question mark became in with mental health was what is our definition of someone who would be deemed mentally insane during the time period? And so that was a huge gray area. And because of that, terrible conditions began to give way. There was accounts of patient abuses, of those being locked up, overcrowded facilities became dark in uh, dreary places. Some patients were restrained in straitjackets. You heard more stories of barbaric and inventive procedures beginning to take form, whether lobotomies or electric shock therapies, things that really began to really go opposite of the way Kirkbride had intended them to go. And of course, naturally with this today, you know, as you think of these places and you, and you watch scary movies, for example, or you, you'll see these big, dark, dreary, you know, buildings that almost look haunted in a way. And these were kind of the, the Kirkbrides, right? And so our assessment of these places, what we feel around them kind of give us this spooky feeling. And, and that really kind of came from that mistreatment and, and where mental health went, um, which we would call in, in the profession of mental health today, a big black eye, you know, on, on where this intended to go. In fact, another personal story, and this goes with Cherokee, the superintendent at the time, just an amazing person. I really looked up to him. And I remember one time when he came to Cherokee, he had learned about the cemetery. So the, the mental health had a cemetery and it was almost hidden in the back. It was hidden um, down in down the hillside, which now sits on some grazing land on a for a farm in the area, and the tombstones didn't have any names on them; they only had numbers. And it was sad because you could tell that in most cases they probably weren't even buried in, in a box; that they were probably just wrapped in cloth and buried. And so, as their body decayed, the ground began to settle. And you could kind of see these different areas. And, and, and it was sad because a lot of these places, you know, if you were admitted into a state facility, the only way that you could get out was the person who admitted you would have to come get you. And if that wasn't the case and that they wouldn't let you out, then it was just like a prison. And that was not the intent of how this was supposed to, to play out. And so, um, so Tom he went out of his way and he started researching and he tried vividly because he wanted to, uh, he wanted to make this right. He wanted to be humane in the way of finding out who these individuals were and give them a name. 
not just the number and bury them right. And so he searched and he searched and he searched. And he, I remember um, hearing the painful stories later that he, that he was not able to find it. No matter how hard he tried to find the records, how sad he couldn't find the names of those who were buried there. And that just cemented into my mind today um, of just the mistreatment back in the turn of the century with mental health. So let's take a look at Kirkbrides as a whole. There were over 300 Kirkbrides that they think were built during the 19th century, which was often known kind of as the golden age of mental health treatment. So there were some new things that were coming about and new ways that they were looking at doing this. And out of that grouping today, we are aware of 73 Kirkbrides that were built in the U.S., and out of those 73 Kirkbrides that were built in the U.S., about 30 or 30-some are still standing and are restored as historical places. And so the other 40 were either demolished or completely abandoned. And the question really remains, why, why save Kirkbrides? This is all part of the, the bigger picture you know, of what we're trying to um, you know, do here at Midwest Ghost Town. So when we look at the abandoned places, and of course there are several, you could go, you could check this out. You could Google it, Kirkbride buildings, and you can see just the ones that are, you know, abandoned to this day. And most importantly, the story should not be forgotten, no matter how ugly as a reminder of what we don't want to repeat, how we can improve, how we can be better as humanity. Abandoned places, ghost towns, all part of our history. This is Midwest Ghost Town. <laughs>